Luke 1, 57. Now the time for Elizabeth to give birth had come, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord was displaying his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There's nobody among your relatives who is called by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, His name is John. And they were all astonished. And at once his mouth was opened, his tongue loosed, and he began to speak in praise of God. Fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them kept them in, uh, kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was clearly with him. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, he spoke by, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father. To grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways. To give to his people the knowledge of salvation. By the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God. With which the sunrise from on high will visit us. To shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is the word of God. Amen? Let's say one more quick word of prayer and thank him. Father, we thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for illuminating the scriptures to us, and we just ask for a lot more of the ministry that you have always done for your people. Do for us now as you have done in the past. We pray this in Jesus' name and under his blood. Amen. Last service, we had a... Uh, baptism, which we love. Um, we didn't get to catch it on video. Um, and the question came up, you know, as we're observing the Christian ordinances of baptism and communion, do we do so wearing masks? And I'm like, how do you take, a, take communion wearing a mask? And then, of course, if you do baptism with a mask, it's called waterboarding, and I think there's uh, laws against that. So uh, we, we uh, pushed a couple of boundaries there to bring somebody ceremonially into the kingdom of God. And uh, it's great to see old lives become new, dead hearts come alive, and where there was once despair and disorder, we get to see joy and transformation and hope and reason in all of our lives. We've all got these stories in various ways. What we're going to be seeing here today in Luke chapter 1 is that Zacharias is going to explain the God who gives us this new life. He sings a song. Right? And we saw this last week as well. Pastor Kevin was explaining the song of Mary when she found out that she was going to be giving birth to the Messiah. She broke into song. And Pastor Kevin said something that I thought was just a perfect summary, so I'm going to steal it and uh, own it for today. He, uh, he said in, in the book of Psalms, which is kind of the song book of Israel, a psalm is a, a, a song that is directed towards God. And in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms is the longest book because God's people have always just loved to sing. There's 150 psalms in the Old Testament book of Psalms, and Mary shows up and says, I think it's time for number 151. Here we go. I'm going to sing about the Messiah. And then Zacharias comes in right on her heels and says, here's Psalm 152. And then we're going to see a couple more in the beginning of Luke's gospel. In chapter 2, we're going to see the, uh, the shepherds sing. We're going to see this old guy named Simeon in the temple. He's going to sing a song of praise. And we get this picture from Luke's gospel that God's people tend to be pretty musical just by their nature. There's something in our DNA that likes to sing to God. What is that? Why do we do the things we do? Why do we open up with songs? It's not just because it's habit. It is habit, but the habit has a reason behind it. 
God loves. He gets overjoyed. He has a blast. He gets giddy and starts jumping up and down when he hears his kids sing the same thing at the same time in the same place to the same God. There's a unity there. And some people don't like it. They don't like singing congregationally because it's like, oh, I, you know, I, I can't sing. And God's like, dude, I don't care. You guys know what it's like when your kids are in the back seat at a, you know, on a road trip or something and they're just singing? I mean, it sounds horrible. It wouldn't sell. You know, forget about production quality. But isn't that the greatest music ever for like the first five minutes until you just get sick of hearing the song that never ends over and over? But there's a beauty to that that God the Father hears when his children sing. So there's a reason behind what we do. Let me ask you this. Why do you show up to church on Sundays? Is it because it's a habit? Well, for a lot of us, yeah. You know, I was, I was, I'm one of those kids that was basically born on the front pew, been in church my whole life. If I'm sick on a Sunday, I feel like I'm breaking a law. If I take a vacation and I'm not here on a Sunday, I feel like I'm playing hooky and getting away with something. And there's a little bit of a thrill like when I used to skip class in high school, which I never did, children, uh, versus, you know, skipping church. But then also I feel guilty about it and I'm like, I should be somewhere else right now. So yeah, it's a habit to gather on Sunday mornings. But the habit has a reason behind it. Christians gather just by impulse. It's just by our nature. There's just something in us that like even when it's illegal, we get together. It's just what we do in various forms. You know, these days, sometimes we got to gather online. Sometimes, you know, we, we get together in person and everybody's got the Holy Spirit telling them, just get together with my people by any means necessary. Part of the challenge for Christians here in our time now today is to figure out what that obedience looks like. But not gathering is not an option for the people of God. We just always do these things. Why? Because God has given us a new nature, and it includes certain actions. One of those actions is to sing. Today, we're going to learn from Zacharias how to sing. How do we do this in the presence of people? We learned some from Mary last week. Mary's song was very individual. It was very much uh, saying, look what God has done for me, and look what God has done for people like me. Look what God does for the lowly. He exalts them. Look what he does for the humble. He places honor upon them. So it was a very personal engagement with God. Zacharias' song is a very national engagement with God. Whereas Mary was saying, look what he's done for me, Zacharias is saying, guys, look what he's doing for us. Yeah, celebration bump. All right. So what he's doing here is he's directing the attention of a nation towards God who has his attention on them, right? Right? He's saying, God's paying attention to us. Let's return the favor. Let's do the only reasonable thing and talk to the God who's talking to us. Luke chapter 1. We call this song the Benedictus because for about a thousand years or a little more, the Latin Bible was the most common. And in Latin, this song starts out, you know, Benedictus, Deus, Dominus, Dominus, Deus, Israel, whatever. I don't, I'm, that's my, as good as my Latin gets. But it, it says here, like verse 68, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, right? So the first word there in Latin is benedictus, so they just take that as the title, and that's how this is known. And what he's doing is he's blessing God. He's speaking highly to God. He's speaking highly of God. The term benediction, bene is good. It's like benefit, right? And the term diction is to speak, so it's, he's speaking highly of, he's blessing God. That's the point of this thing. So we're gonna crack into the content here and, uh, but what it says, the content of what it says, is equally as important as why he says it and the point in the story at which he says it. If you weren't here a few weeks ago when we introduced this character of Zacharias, let me give you a, a quick rundown. He was a priest in Israel. At the time, a priest was a person who was honored in the community, but really no big deal. It wasn't like, you know, a, it wasn't a celebrity status. He was basically just a small town pastor. He and his wife, Elizabeth, they were old. We're not told how old, but it's clear that the baby boat has sailed and it ain't coming back. Like they're they're past childbearing age, okay? And so they didn't have any kids. And this was, of course, for them, a source of great sadness. It's also dangerous because as you get old, you need kids to produce so that they can provide for you as your ability to physically work and produce declines. They didn't have this. So it's likely that Zacharias was just an old faithful priest in his village, teaching the word of God to people and probably working a job on the side, trusting God for provision, and God had never let them down. And so there was a certain rotation in place where the priests would, you know, a contingent of them would go to Jerusalem and do these religious rites and so on. And his number came up, 
And so it was Zacharias' turn to go into the holy place in the temple and offer a a sacrifice to God. This thing's supposed to take about 30 seconds, right? You walk in, you say a prayer, you drop some incense on a flame, and the the smell, um, it says it ascends the, uh, it ascends to the Lord as a pleasing aroma, and this represents the prayers of God's people going up to him. So essentially, he's standing there saying, God, please accept the prayers of your people Israel. And then he's going to turn around, go out. That's it. But it takes a little longer this time. And everybody's outside like, what's he doing in there? Well, what Luke does is he peels back the curtain and he shows us what's going on. And what happened was when Zacharias was in there alone, the angel Gabriel shows up, scared the daylights out of him. And he was like, yo, Zach. And he was like, ah, what ha- what's happening right now? Goes nuts. And Gabriel says, calm down. I've got a message for you. And he says, your wife is going to have a baby. And he's like, bro, I'm like 70. <laughs> like, you know, 60, 70, 80. I don't know how old he was. But he's like, my wife ain't having no kid. Do you know how this whole thing works? You know? And Gabriel basically says, yeah, hey, you know what? Be quiet for a minute. I'm talking. You're going to have a baby, and he's going to be the one that announces the Messiah to come in and solve the whole world's God problem. Your kid's going to be the guy out front of the Messiah blowing the trumpet saying, drop what you're doing and look at him. Clear the way and then get as close to this guy as possible. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's your boy. And Zacharias was like, can I get some kind of proof or sign? This is just really hard to believe. And Gabriel actually gets annoyed with him. He's like, hey, like I'm, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Like, you know where I was 30 seconds ago? This is coming straight from the top, dude. You don't get to ask me for proof. So he gives him a sign, which is a little bit sarcastic, a little bit um, poetic justice, and he takes away his ability to talk. He says, I'm tired of your doubting. I'm tired of your responses. Here's your sign. You don't get to talk for a while. And so Zacharias was silent for the whole duration of his wife's pregnancy. He finishes out his week of service in silence, goes home, resumes normal life, and wouldn't you know it, his wife ends up with child. God keeps his promises. So Zacharias then has to go through the whole pregnancy, and his wife Elizabeth has to go through the whole pregnancy without him being able to talk. Now, some of you ladies are probably like, that must have been awesome for her. I, I don't think so. I think that when somebody, when, when somebody is pregnant, there's a lot of reassurances needed and comfort and, and stability, and the husband is there to provide all of that stuff. You guys know how it is. The emotions are going like this sometimes, and the hormone fluctuations, and everything that a mother's body does to prepare to provide for and nourish this child and deliver and all of that. The husband serves a very vital role in that whole process, and a lot of it is his words. Okay, speaking tenderly and reassuringly to his wife. Zacharias couldn't do that, and Elizabeth could not benefit from that. I'm sure that Zacharias wanted nothing more than to put his head on his wife's tummy and speak to his son and feel his son kick his cheek in response to the boom of his voice. Couldn't do it. I'm sure that Elizabeth wanted nothing more than to hear her husband walk around the house singing the great psalms of Israel and asking for a blessing on their home, but she couldn't hear it. And so this is actually, I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, cute and funny, like, oh, he, le- he didn't let him talk for nine months. But that's a crucial nine months. And then on top of that, he was a teacher. He was a priest. And I'm telling you guys, when a teacher can't teach the Bible, it's like Jeremiah 20, verse 9 says it. It says, your word is like a fire in my bones. And if I try to shut my mouth and not say something, it will consume me internally. And Zacharias has spent his whole life now being a teacher of God's word. So I, with all the scriptural information we have, I assume this must have been absolute torture for him and relatively devastating, temporarily, for his wife. So nine months comes along. Six months into that nine, Mary shows up, and she says, Gabriel visited me too. And she tells Zacharias and Elizabeth everything that Gabriel had said to her. She says, I have the Messiah in my tummy. So Zacharias is sitting back piecing all of this stuff together, and he gets a picture of what God's doing. Now, what did he do with those nine months? We're not told, but I think we can piece it together. I'm gonna, let me build a case here. I think that Zacharias spent nine months just pouring over the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew Bible. I think he spent 
all of his time during the day, every second that he could muster, just reading this thing and saying, all right, God, what are you doing? What are the promises? How are they going to come to pass? What promises have you kept in the past? Let's review these covenants. Who are you and what are you doing? And I think he just devoured these scrolls. He was a priest. He was the guy in the village that would have had access to the scrolls, right? And I think he just absolutely tore them up with his eyes. Now, the reason I think that is because when he finally opened his mouth, what came out? Or I should say when God finally opened his mouth, because he couldn't do it by his own power. What came out was just a, a flurry. It was an absolute avalanche of Old Testament quotations. Some scholars have combed through this and seen as many as 33 direct quotations or allusions to Old Testament passages and truths. 33 in like what, 11 verses? That is a densely packed praise song. Okay? So we learn a few things from Zacharias. And I want to I take a minute and just point out a few of them before we get into the content here. Because it is just as important that we learn from him as a disciple as it is that we agree with what it is that he actually said. First thing we learn is that he was pressurized with the word of God. Nine months just going to the word. Every time he would have been doing something else, he instead takes that energy and goes toward the word. And as he puts the word of God, as he hides it in his heart, this ends up being kind of the, the library from which the Holy Spirit would draw when he finally opens his mouth. This is the source material that God uses for him to say something. So that by the time he finally does open his mouth, it's God's words and not his. So, how's your Bible reading going lately? Now, I know a lot of us, we answer that question with, you know, kind of a uniform, like, yeah, I could be doing better, you know. Can I just take a moment and try to add a note of urgency to that? We talk about our Bible reading the same way we talk about getting our, our diet balanced out, you know. Yeah, I'm probably not eating as well as I should. I'm pretty health conscious, but yeah, there was that birthday party. I had a piece of cake. Whoops. And we talk about our Bible reading the same way. Ah, I went a couple of weeks without really reading the Bible. I should probably do better. What? This isn't some kind of potassium deficiency that makes our eye twitch. That's magnesium, right? Whatever. This isn't some kind of thing where it's like, yeah, I should probably balance stuff out eventually because, you know, it's the responsible thing to do. No, Zacharias treats this like a document of survival. This is a wartime blueprint. And he has to feed on this. He has to put this in his head because it's all he's got. I've said it many times. The Bible takes on a whole new meaning when it stops being a trivia book and it starts becoming a survival manual. When you look at this thing as the bread, the words of eternal life, this is like air for our spirit. And without it, we start to suffocate. And it's like the first thing that shuts down in our spiritual mind as we suffocate is our critical thinking to even know that we're suffocating. And so we keep perpetuating the cycle and starving our spirit for the word of God. And before you know it, we're like, I just don't feel as close to God as I used to. How's your Bible reading going, guys? What if we took the same sense of urgency? What if we approached the Bible and our time with the Lord less as a ritual, less as just a good habit? It is a good habit. But what if it went from just being a good habit to being something without which I can't engage the world that God has called me to go and engage? So, he reads and he reads and he thinks and he prays and he processes and he meditates on it and he studies it and he chews on the word of God so that finally when it's time for him to speak, the Holy Spirit goes, after nine months of that, right? And he just explodes the good news of the gospel all over everybody in the room. He was pressurized with the word of God. I sense a lack of pressure. Okay? I sense, uh, I could be wrong about this, but a general fearfulness, maybe. Not so much in this church, but just in maybe the larger Christian community, right? Which, I mean, the whole world is connected right now. So you see it all over the place. You can see what's going on on, on Facebook. You can track general trends. I, I, I sense less of an urgency, a thirst, a starvation for the word of God and more of a brainstorming session about how we're going to try and stave off the coming disaster for one more generation. What if we shifted our emphasis? What if we were more like Zacharias? Give me your word that I may have life. The rest will take care of itself. God is good. God keeps his promises. We're going to trust him to do what he's going to do. I just need to eat today. 
So we learn that he was pressurized. We also learn that he was ready, catch this, parents and grandparents, he was ready to disciple a world changer at home. Okay? John the Baptist was born to announce the Messiah to Israel. That's a big job. Okay? John the Baptist was basically, his, his um, function, and we'll see more about his message in chapter 3, but his function was basically to be a signpost to the Messiah. Right? What a sign does is it says, hey, this place that you're going is that way. Keep going that way. It doesn't give you a lot of specifics about where you're going. If you're driving to Yakima, which I don't recommend, but if you do have to drive to Yakima, you will see a sign that says, Yakima is this way. That's all it says. It doesn't tell you anything about it. It doesn't tell you how awful it is once you get there. It just says, Yakima is this way. I, I cracked a joke about Yakima a while ago, and somebody said, hey, you can't say that, man. There's people from Yakima here in the audience. And I was like, I know. They were the ones in the back amening me. They know it better than anybody. <laughs> it's terrible. So John was the signpost. Some specifics, here's what Jesus is going to do, you know, here, here's the, the messianic function, but generally it was just like, look, get your eyes off of me and on to him. His followers came to him and said, man, this Jesus guy is stealing all of your people, man. Your attendance is going down, his attendance is going up. The church across, the church across town is growing, what do we do? <laughs> you, know? you know what John's answer was? I must decrease, he must increase. Wow. When was the last time you heard somebody say that? Take everybody that's paying attention to me right now and send them over to him. That was John's function. Now, in order to do that, he was going to have to go toe-to-toe with the Pharisees, the religious leaders. These guys were the Harvard professors of the Old Testament. It was not uncommon for a Pharisee, in fact, it was kind of standard practice, for a Pharisee or a scribe, especially the scribes, to have the whole book of Psalms memorized in Hebrew wasn't their native language. They spoke Aramaic. They would have them memorized in Hebrew, okay? These are the guys, like, they know the Bible that well, and John, at the age of 30, was going to go toe-to-toe with these guys, argue theology with them, and win. He had to be ready for that. So if that's the kid that's born into your house, you know he's going to have a spiritual aptitude that's going to blow you away. He's going to have an understanding of the deep things of God, and you as the parent have to be ready to feed that and to guide him and to explain these things that you're reading to him. Are you ready to disciple a world changer in your own home? Do you have a clear understanding of the gospel? Do you know how to navigate the Bible to the point where when your kid asks you a question that you don't know the answer to, you can go and find it? Or even, are you plugged into a local church that if you can't find it, you got people you can call and say, help me with this? Are you ready to disciple a world changer? It's not easy. We don't know what our kids are going to grow up to be. Zacharias knew what his son was going to grow up to be. But what if our kids are these world changers? I mean, I hope so, right? Have you seen the world that we're handing to our kids? It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad in a lot of ways. And we want our kids to be equipped to engage that because there's a war going on right now. You see it, I see it, and they're either going to be casualties or they're going to be champions. The middle ground is evaporating. So are we ready to disciple them? Your kids have the most profound spiritual questions of anybody. If, you know, I get, I get to disciple people all the time. It's great. The hardest questions I get are from kids. Okay? They don't think in the same rigid categories that we do. In fact, with my own kids, sometimes I wish I could just be like, go ask your pastor. I have no idea how to even start that. But that doesn't work in my house. But kids ask things with spiritual insight, and we just have to be prepared to do our jobs. This is like the basic job. God gives us kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, whatever, in order to influence them for Christ, to be a light in a dark world for them. Are we ready to do our jobs? If not, let's get pressurized. Spend some more time in the Word. Learn to understand it. Get discipled yourself and then pass along that which you have received. The third thing, so we see that he was pressurized with the word of God until he just was about to pop, and finally the Holy Spirit, you know, he popped the top on this thing, and Zacharias must have been so relieved. We see that he was ready to disciple a world changer at home, at the drop of a hat, around a dinner table, in the living room. This is necessary. And we also see that he valued doctrine. Okay? Now, I just say this because it's kind of countercultural in what I guess I would call Western evangelicalism. It seems like biblical understanding, a deep understanding and an ability to articulate 
the gospel, an ability to articulate and be conversant, be fluent in the things of God, talking about his character, who he is, what he does. It's almost like it's a race to the bottom these days in a lot of ways. Right? I don't want all that fancy stuff. I just want Jesus. Right? You even hear sometimes, doctrine divides. Don't give me doctrine. Don't give me theology. Just give me Jesus. This makes no sense, people. Let's not fall for that. Okay? Our doctrine, our theology, is our understanding of who Jesus is. And if we know him, we have a theology. Right? We want it to be deep and resounding. We want to know him better than we know ourselves. We want to spend so much time with him that we become like the, per- the, the person that we hang out with the most. And we grow in godliness just by sheer proximity. Zacharias was attentive to the details of the things of God. He loved doctrine. And he wrote songs like that. We need these songs in the church, guys. Think about this. Okay? Um, when Satan tempts me to despair... And tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. You hear that song? We get to explore these ideas. We get to learn something. We get to interact with the character of God by just turning him over in our heads and saying, what does he show me when I look at him from this angle and from this angle? Now you contrast that with, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I'm not done yet. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. If you were in a youth group in the 90s, you sang that song a lot. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Great. We could repeat an idea or we could press into the Lord and say, tell me who you are. Zacharias goes for option B. Now, there's a time to just sit and sing a a phrase of deep meaning repetitively and to soak in that, take it in. I would suggest to you that those times are more appropriate usually in private where we can take all the time we need, but in public we get so little time together that we should do like Colossians 3.16 says and teach each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's what Zacharias does here. His song which I I think he probably, I can't prove this, I think he probably wrote this during his silence. I don't know that this is spontaneous. He, regardless, he he has this song that is what A.W. Tozer says has density of content. He says a good song in a church has density of content. So by the way, we need more. If you're a lyricist, if you're a songwriter, we've got some people around Grace and Truth that are like, man, we got to write some songs on these neglected topics. So you're going to start hearing these pretty soon because some guys are cranking out the lyrics, some guys are putting them to music. And so we got one in the pipeline that's just a song of repentance because we don't sing enough of those. We got one in the pipeline that's thanking God for giving us spiritual gifts. When was the last time we had a song like that? There are all these neglected doctrines and they deserve to be sung, sung, sang. They deserve to have music about them, okay? And so we need to get these things in the church. If you can contribute to that, Write some songs. Bring them to us. If they're good, we'll play them. If not, we'll pat you on the back and say, good try. I don't know. So we learn these things from Zacharias. Now, what does he actually say? The most important thing here that I want you to see is in verse 67. His father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Now, if you know who the Holy Spirit is, you know that he's got a job. And his job, his function within this triune relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all equally God, all equally glorious, deserving of worship, but they serve each other. It's a pretty cool relationship. It's like a family supposed to be. Everybody's equal, but they serve each other. And the Holy Spirit's job, his function that he has declared, is to lift Christ high. So when you see that the Holy Spirit is about to do something, you know that the point of whatever's coming next is that Jesus deserves glory. If we get through this song of Zacharias and we see anything other than Jesus as the main point, we've missed something completely because that's not what the Holy Spirit's doing. The Holy Spirit opened his mouth and he prophesied. So who is this song going to be about, Grace and Truth? Jesus, that's right. And he says a couple of things. He says that God Jesus is God. He's the fulfillment of all of these things from God. God has promised certain things. If you look at verse 69, he has kept his promise to David. If you look at verse 70, he has kept his promise to Israel. That's what he means when he says, by the mouth of the prophets, the holy prophets. 
Verse 73, he has kept his promise to Abraham. Verse 78, he has kept his promise from the minor prophets to make the sun rise on a dark world. And Jesus would be the light of the world in John 8, 12. So essentially what Zacharias is saying is, our God is a promise-keeping God. Now I'm just going to walk you through a couple of these examples here. We're going to talk about David. We're going to talk about Abraham. That's it. Verse 69. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. What's that about? Well, the horn is, a, is an often discussed symbol in the Old Testament. I got one of these bad boys. They call this a shofar. Uh, you can blow this like a trumpet. I'm not going to because I'm worried the building will fall down like Jericho or Maybe, you know, Jesus is going to be like, no, I'm not ready to come back yet, kiddo, stop it. But you can blow this thing like a trumpet. It's got a pretty cool sound. You can come up and try it afterwards if you want. Oh, oh never mind, corona, whatever. So <laughs> what, what this symbolizes in the Bible has about three or four different angles. In Deuteronomy 33, for example, uh, there's a prophecy over one of the tribes of Israel that says, you are like a horn, you're an ornament, you're a decoration. This is a cool thing. When you see two of these on a ram, you look at that and you say, that is a magnificent animal. Look at that thing. This was supposedly uh, on a, a ram from Israel. It's probably made in Oklahoma or something. I don't know. But eBay says it's from Israel. And what they do is uh, they, they, after they slaughter the ram, they cut this thing off. They bore it out so that you can use it as a trumpet, as an instrument. But primarily, it's designed as a decoration, as an ornament. And when you look at this thing, you can see the incredible design in it. This, this side looks different than this side, so it must serve a different function in the, you know, when a ram is fighting another ram or something like that. This one has a, a lip that kind of curls around it like a smooth staircase. It's, you know, it's, it's just beautiful. And so this is designed to sit on a mantle. It's an ornament. So when he says that God has raised up a horn of salvation, he's saying there's something here worth looking at. Okay? God has adorned his creation, and all of the beauty and the magnificence and, and everything that that represents is going to be focused on this Messiah that's in Mary's tummy. Now, not only is it an ornament, it's also a weapon. Rams fight. That's why they have horns. They fight with each other, usually over women. <laughs> it tends to be a thing in the animal kingdom, I guess. And so they fight, and this thing ends up not just being beautiful and decorative, but actually being a tool for death and destruction. And so the same horn that can, you know, be a beautiful piece of art or decoration on the head of a ram or on a mantelpiece winds up being the absolute doom of its enemy. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? He is of supreme value and beauty and perfection. But man, I've read Revelation 19 and I do not want to be on the other end of his judgment. He is your best friend, or he is your judge. Also, it's a tool for war, for announcing that war is coming. If you look at Joshua 6, for example, uh, God said, hey, go take Jericho. The pagans have it. I want it. I'm giving it to you. Go get it. Well, they can't take Jericho. These guys have been wandering in the desert for 40 years, living on manna. Right? They're not ready for Jericho. It's a fortress. So God has them march around the walled city of Jericho, for like, what, seven days, they march around it and stuff, and then they blow the shofar, the trumpet, the horn, depending on your translation. And as they blow this thing, the walls come crumbling down. And the point of that is, when you're not strong enough to fight the battle, God fights it for you, and he wins the victory. Their enemy was Jericho. Your enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. Your enemy is sin. Your enemy is death. Your Goliath is the unbeatable giant of death. You can't win. You can't do it. But he says, raise up a horn and let the Lord go before you and fight for you. He will win. And so he says that he has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of David. Now, David talks a lot about the horn. He was a warrior. He was fluent in the Old Testament narratives, and he understood the symbolism of the horn. So he writes something like Psalm 18 too. David says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. What Zacharias is saying here is that everything that God showed about himself, 
through the theme of the horn in the Old Testament, he's about to do for all of his people globally, starting with Israel, through this Messiah. Watch his deliverance. That's, by the way, why the kid was named Jesus. It means God saves, right? It means deliverance. It's the horn of salvation. Now, he says also in the house of his servant David, we're going to talk more about that in chapter 3, but the reference there is to a promise that God made to David. He told David, your son will sit on the throne of Israel forever. Now, of course, David thought that that meant, okay, good, my son will be king, and then his son will be king, and then his son will be king, and so on. But his sons were so jacked up because David wasn't the greatest dad that by generation number two, they have wandered off of this path. So there was no king on the throne of Israel. But God's purposes will not be thrown off. And so he takes Jesus from the line of David down the road, a thousand years later, and he says he will sit on the throne of Israel forever. Forget about the succession and the lineage. That permanent promise is all focused on this baby, Jesus. So he has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of David, his servant. You guys see how densely packed these ideas are, right? Like, Zacharias just had all this stuff stewing in there to where it becomes his native language. Verse 73, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father. And what he's saying there is that he made a promise to Abraham and God keeps his promises. Okay? Let me briefly describe the promise to Abraham and you'll see your place in this. And we'll go forward in that promise. God called out Abraham and said, hey, I want you to leave everything you know. Abraham obeyed like that. We don't know why. God just said, move it. And Abraham said, yes, sir. Actually, he didn't even say anything in Genesis 12. He just went. It says that in 15.6 that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So God then, in chapter 15, he puts out a ceremony for Abraham. God likes ceremonies sometimes. He likes these rituals. They're teaching tools. So he says, all right, Abraham, you, me, we're going to make a promise together according to the customs of the day. And this is a little bit gross. I hope I don't cause any nausea here. What would happen is they would take an animal and cut it in half, and they would divide the two halves of the animal. There was no cleanup involved. It was messy. And so you got the two halves of the animal, you split them apart, and all the goodies just squish out in the middle. And what would happen is that one party making a promise would walk between the two halves of the animal. The blood, the guts, the gore, it gets on your sandals, gets between your toes, gets on the bottom of your robe, just ruins everything, and it smells horrendous. And so you walk between the two halves of the animal. Now what you're saying when you walk through those two halves is, if I break this promise, may this animal's fate become my fate. I accept death if I break this promise. This promise that I'm making is more important than life itself, and I give you the legal right to come and kill me if I break my promise. So one person would walk through, and then the other person would walk through. It's called cutting the covenant. So God cuts a covenant with Abraham, but he throws a curveball at him. You would expect that God would somehow take on some physical form and then go through the two halves of the animal, and then Abraham would go through. But instead, God puts Abraham to sleep. There was a deep sleep, but he was still kind of aware so much so that he could hear what God was saying. It was a trance-like state, I guess, is the best way I could describe it. And so he told Abraham, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through, and then I'm going to come back and go through again. Now, why would God go through twice? Catch the symbolism here. What he said was, if I, God, break the terms of this covenant, then I accept the fate of this animal. How would God die? We could get to that some other time. But then he goes back and he says, if you, Abraham, break the terms of this covenant, I accept the fate of this animal. In other words, if Abraham sins against God, God will die for Abraham's sin. Gospel, right? He keeps a promise to Abraham to take away the sins, to pay the punishment, to give the life and the blood and the sacrifice necessary for that relationship to be made right. And so what Zacharias is saying is, That promise and so many others that were made to Abraham, they're all happening. God is doing something right now through my son, through the Messiah in Mary's tummy. And I want all of Israel to know that they can trust God because he keeps his promises. When we enter into a relationship with God, we don't do so by just acknowledging our sin. 
You know, knowing you're, you're a sinner is fine, but that's not enough. Again, Satan knows he's a sinner. Doesn't care. Doesn't help him at all. Some people will come to God and say, I feel really bad for my sin. And they think that that's what he's looking for. But a feeling of guilt is not the requirement for salvation. That's not the saving criteria. Oftentimes, and in other religions, people will come to God and say, I will do X, Y, and Z for you. If I do good to balance out the bad, then we're back to zero again and you can accept me. God says that's not how it works. Even if you could do that, it wouldn't be how it works. I was talking to some missionaries from a a cult. Many times I've had the same conversation. I said, all right, you tell me what I must do to be saved. Give me your gospel. I'll give you my gospel. I promise mine's better. But let's swap gospels and we'll see what happens. I said, what must I do to be saved then? And they said, you must believe in Jesus, so far so good, and keep the Ten Commandments. And I'm like, well, then I'm toast. The very first commandment is have no other gods before me. No idols. I've had idols. You had idols? I can't rewind the clock. I broke the first commandment. Forget about the other nine. I can't even make it to step one. The first rung of the ladder. There is no keeping the Ten Commandments for me. Somebody's going to have to do this for me if it's going to get counted to my account. So what does God say about how we relate to him? It's not by bringing him some offering that he, will be, uh, that he will be pleased with. That all comes later. It's not by feeling bad. It's not by making up for the bad stuff you've done. It's not even by changing your ways and going the other direction. All of that stuff comes later. Instead, what we do is we come to God and we say, I have broken the covenant. I've sinned against you. I'm a sinner. But you have solved my problem and I trust you that it worked. I trust you that you are a promise-keeping God. And when Jesus was on the cross in John 19.30 and he yelled with his last breath in the book of John before he resurrected, he said, it is finished. And we trust him that he was right, that he has the power to follow through on that. And after he died, then he rose from the dead because even though he said it was finished and we have eternal life available to us, he then demonstrated that he's got the power to follow through on this massive earth-shaking statement that he made. So we look at his death, we look at his resurrection, and we say, there's nothing I can bring to the table. I can't pass through this animal. What you have done is sufficient. You get the question sometimes, you know, you say we're not saved by works, but isn't trusting God a work? Placing your faith in God, isn't that an act? Isn't that a work? And from God's perspective, no. Faith is when you stop working. When you say, all of my work is just adding to the problem, I'll work for you with the rest of my life, but none of that's going to save me. You have worked for me, and I trust that you did it in such a way that it results in eternal life for me. I believe you. I trust you. In Luke chapter 1 here, he doesn't say that, he, he doesn't use the word new covenant. But that's kind of the elephant in the room. He says, there's a new way of relating to God because God has fulfilled his promises. Okay? You can come to God directly because of what Jesus has done. You don't need to slaughter a ram and a lamb and a bull and twist the head off of a pigeon like in Leviticus. Like It gets gory. Sin is a bloody, gory, serious deal. And he says all of that's been nailed to the cross and is taken care of. Now, Jesus comes forward and says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You can have a relationship with God. Why? Because he keeps his promises And he promised not to send you to hell if you will just trust him not to. It's like like all all that is required to be declared innocent is a guilty plea. And you cast yourself on the mercy of the judge, and he promises that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I will turn away no one who comes to me, he says. This is gracious. This is merciful. And what we're going to see next week in this last passage, I was positive I was going to get to the end of Luke 1 today. I was like, all right, we're finishing Luke 1. And I'm looking at this. I'm like, there's no way. Because next week, what we're going to see in this song is exactly why God would save us. Yes, he loves us. Yes, he made all these promises to us. Yes, he fulfills them. But ask yourself this question. Why would he do that? Now, the first answer that comes to your mind is a good one. He would save us because he loves us. Yes. And I'm going to blow that shofar of God's love until the day I die. But This goes deeper and wider than we could ever even imagine. What happens as we explore the reason that God saves us 
is that he creates new categories in our mind and then he breaks out of those categories that he created for us. It's like he answers questions that we didn't even know to ask and then he goes above and beyond those answers that we can comprehend. This is why Paul, in the book of Romans, in explaining the love that God has for us, he ends in the end of chapter 11 after the most magnificent theological treatise ever written. He says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the love of God. I mean, good luck trying to explain it. And I'm like, you just wrote Romans. You did explain it. He's like, yeah, but barely. Oh, if we only knew. And so next week what we're going to see is, why would God save us? And what that's going to lead into is, guys, what's the point of life? Like, what's the, Honestly, what's the point of life? Think about this. Every breath that you have is handed to you by the decision of God. You're alive today because he made a conscious decision to keep his life pumping through you. Why? What are you supposed to do with it? Zacharias is going to tell us. Now, I promise that you will hear the meaning of life next week. I cannot promise that you're going to have ears to hear it. I can't promise that you're going to understand it. I can't do that for you. That's between you and God. Your parents can't do that for you. Your spouse can't do that for you. You got to take that up with the Lord. I want you guys to do some introspection this week. Every week I send you out of here and I say, go save the world, go share the gospel, go make some disciples. Yeah, keep doing that. But take this week and do some introspection. Have you heard the voice of the shepherd? Would you know what God was saying if you heard it? Or do, when you read this thing, is it black ink on a white page. Is, is that where it stops for you? As the meaning of life gets declared, this seems like, you know, the eternal human question. Why is there something rather than nothing? As Christians, we're like, dude, I learned that in Sunday school. That's not a hard, it's not a hard question. And yet it continues to perplex us because we can't naturally hear the voice of God. If you can't hear God's voice when he talks, I want you to come and talk to me because I'm not God my voice is not his voice, but he has told us what is good for us. He's told us what his plans are for us. He's told us why we are here rather than not here, why there is something rather than nothing, and why you continue to take breaths. He's given us those answers. And if you don't know, we need to get that fixed up or else next week is just going to be attendance of church by habit. We're just going to keep the religious hamster wheel going. And at the end, the trumpet will blow. And Jesus will come back, and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. I don't want that for you. There's a better way. Last service, as I closed in prayer, we went inside and saw a baptism. By the way, if, uh, if we pray, we share the gospel, maybe God will give us one person to baptize every service, so the second service won't miss out on a baptism. So let's get to work, shall we? <laughs> but we saw a baptism which is a step of, it's a demonstration of faith in God. We're saying, I believe you, and I'm willing to state it with my actions publicly. Some of you guys have trusted in Christ, but you need help getting started in following him and grabbing hold of the meaning for which he has given you life. We can help with that too. We call it making disciples. That's what we do around here. Okay? So come and talk to us. Talk to Pastor Kevin. Talk to Pastor Greg, Pastor Bill, any of these guys. You know, I mean, look, just... Throw a dart, and you're going to find somebody that knows the meaning of life in this place, okay? Get help. I can't get it for you, but we can offer to come alongside you. Let me pray. God, you have told us what's good for us. You've told us what to love, what to hate, what to receive, and what to reject. The problem isn't that we don't know. The problem is we disagree. We're born disagreeing in a lot of ways. I, you know, I think about this sometimes, right? You go through Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit and all of these nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Against such things there is no law. Nobody's going to say that love and joy and peace, patience and kindness and graciousness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-discipline, nobody's going to say those are bad things. And yet for some reason we run the opposite direction so often even while declaring that these things are good virtues. We're just hypocrites. We know what's right. We don't do what's wrong because we don't know. We do what's wrong because we like it. But you offer us actual life rather than just a heartbeat on our way to death. 
You offer us salvation rather than just pleasure. You offer us meaning rather than just answers. And I'm afraid that we don't place a high enough value on what you have said because we are too busy trying to do and to try to make things happen. People that are not believers are trying to find meaning or salvation in something else. People that are believers are taking attention that is rightly given to you and maybe giving an undue emphasis to the things of this world. Not that we should ignore them, but that we should not idolize them. And we fall into that trap because we're weak and foolish by nature. But we need your wisdom. So I pray that you would convince us of the stuff that Zacharias knows. You would convince us that you are a promise-keeping God who has said that you will save all of your people, invited people into that saving relationship, and you have the power and the love and the integrity to follow through on what you have said. I pray that you would cause us to believe that, that, you're, that those that are not yet your children would become your children, and that those that are your children and struggling to believe this would believe it on a deeper level because it's more true than anything else we could ever find and affirm as being true. So help us, God. Lift us up from where we start. Lift us up from where we stand. You have brought us into being a part of the heavenly Jerusalem. Now teach us what to do once we're here. Pray this in Jesus' name and under his blood. Amen.